Hello and welcome to lecture number two in this course on Introduction to Political Science at Hanyang University, Seoul, South Korea. My name is Professor David Tizard and welcome. In our first lecture we covered <coughs> uh, material from uh, the book The Coddling of the American Mind. From that we looked at the relationship or the formation of groups, specifically political groups and groups based on identity, whether this is identity related to gender, ethnicity, race, uh, political allegiance and so forth. And then from that a moral dichotomy is drawn between the oppressors and the oppressed and the oppressed have the moral virtue and the oppressors therefore should be replaced according to uh, postmodernists if you read them into that such as Herbert Marcuse and so on. In that we learn how tribalism, the grouping of people into tribes, is a biologically natural thing, it's genetic, it's part of our evolutionary history. However, it doesn't remain a constant over history, throughout history. It's something that goes up and down and there will be various structural or systemic factors that will push it up and down. And furthermore, political parties, political leaders or movements and groups might even try to increase the level of tribalism in a society to fulfill or to further their own goals and gains. What we're seeing perhaps more broadly is that in some elements of the West it's becoming more collective. There is a, a movement towards more tribal collective politics with people grouping together. However, in the East we're seeing the opposite, specifically here in South Korea with the arrival of Sabasa and Hon culture, this idea of going by yourself. And from that you understand that it's not static. These things do change and they change over time. So you're looking for what causes these and why they change. We sort of want to understand reasons why these things take part. Because of that nature of time, um, I'm introducing E.H. Carr's uh, book, What is History Now? And today we're going to look at chapter two, Society and the Individual. I highly recommend that you read this book. It's a uh, very insightful, thought-provoking and prescient book. I find that it was very much ahead of its time in what it said and really uh, recommended reading for any young university student. Not to say that everything in there is correct, that's not the point. The point is that it will likely make you think and it will challenge some of your ideas and that is the point. The book itself was banned in South Korea uh, until the late 1980s or early 1990s, I believe. So if that is not motivation enough to read it, I don't know what else could be. <clears throat> Last week, as we looked at the relationship of tribes and how they were growing and this common humanity politics or common enemy politics, that dichotomy of good and evil, which is described by Jonathan Haidt and his co-author as an untruth, they don't believe that's true. We're today looking at the relationship between society and the individual. So this will be a more challenging text and I hope we can get through as much of it as we can. But bear in mind what we're looking for is the relationship between society and the individual, how we interact through that. So without any further ado, let's think about making a start and we'll find the text. We have a very simple uh, aesthetic layout of the text here. I'm sorry it can't be better, but we continue. So E.H. Carr, what is history? Chapter 2, Society and the Individual. The question which comes first, society or the individual, is like the question about the hen and the egg. Whether you treat it as a logical or a historical question, you can make no statement about it one way or the other, which does not have to be corrected by an opposite and equally one-sided statement. Society and the individual are inseparable. They are necessary and complementary to each other, not opposites. No man is an island entire of itself, in Dunn's famous words, John Dunn. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. That is an aspect of the truth. On the other hand, take the dictum of J.S. Mill, the classic individualist. Men are not, when brought together, converted into another kind of substance. Of course not. 
but the fallacy is to suppose that they existed or had any kind of substance before being brought together. As soon as we are born, the world gets to work on us and transforms us from merely biological into social units. And from his earliest years is molded. Every human being at every stage of history or prehistory is born into a society and from his earliest years is molded by that society. The language which he speaks is not an individual inheritance, but a social acquisition from the group in which he grows up. Both language and environment help to determine the character of his thought. His earliest ideas come to him from others. As has well been said, the individual apart from society would be both speechless and mindless. The lasting fascination of the Robinson Crusoe myth is due to its attempt to imagine an, indiv an individual independent of society. The attempt breaks down. Robinson is not an abstract individual, but an Englishman from York. He carries his Bible with him in praise to his tribal god. The myth quickly bestows on him his man Friday, and the building of a new society begins. The other relevant myth is that of Kirillikov in Dostoevsky's Devils, who kills himself in order to demonstrate his perfect freedom. Suicide is the only perfectly free act open to individual man. Every other act involves in one way or another his membership of society. There are a lot of ideas, a lot of thinkers in here. So first of all, you have John Donne. You have this, uh, for whom the bell tolls. modern thing you might recognize that as the title of an orwell book or the name of a metallica song uh, from their uh, ride the lightning album i believe and opposite that the opposite idea we're presented with is j.s mill uh, and here he's saying men are not more than individuals and here, I think we'll come to it later, we'll get into this idea of uh, Emile Durkheim's sui generis facts, social facts, okay? Uh, that will probably come up a little bit later. But you can see there are two opposing uh, thoughts here. John Donne, who is saying that in his famous poem, No Man is an Island, that when somebody dies, we die. We're all connected. We're all part of this one thing, that we do not exist in isolation. J.S. Miller, on the other hand, is saying that well, we're individuals, and when we come together in society, we don't create something bigger than that. If you have one man, or if you have ten men, that ten men don't really equal much more than simply ten men. That's the classical individualist approach. So, are we grouped together, or are we individuals? This is an idea that, you know, over the centuries, over the millennia even, you'll find people on both sides saying what they believe to be the truth of the matter. In terms of the language, so who are we in terms of groups? So we are moulded by history, we are brought together. The language which we speak is not individual but social. Now this is an idea uh, you'll find in Alan Watts and other people. Alan Watts was a British American uh, thinker, philosopher, who spent a lot of time investigating or looking into uh, Eastern thought, Buddhist thought, Hindu thought, as well as Christianity. But he's got a lot of ideas that relate to the suggestion that when you think, imagine that you are sitting at home in your room, you're sitting there thinking about what you should do, should you do this, should you do that, and these thoughts are going around your head and they seem very personal to you. And it's only a matter of your life which you are debating. But Alan Watts would suggest that the words and ideas and thoughts with which you are debating are not your words, thoughts or ideas. For example, you didn't invent the idea that a car is called a car. You didn't invent the idea of dem or abstract things such as freedom, justice, order, democracy, beauty, greed, jealousy, even the concept of I or we. These are not terms that you invented. 
they're not concepts that you invented and they're not linguistic things that you invented they were given to you by society and different societies give different words and concepts to different people so whereas in in the west for example there is a big focus on the i predominantly and you know generally traditionally ilban jogoro in korea you get this big kind of uri thing going on and the i is either uh, like a chonun or a nanun it changes it's fluid it's dependent on who you are with in relation to it's dependent on your relations whereas in the west this i remains static the point of this is to say that language is not neutral language is political which is a george orwell idea as well as others but further than that <clears throat> going back to this alan watts and language creating you because you think in language because you think with ideas you have been shaped by society whether you want to or not and you didn't buy a ticket to enter this society you didn't choose to enter this society it is just something that was bestowed upon you and that's where you get this um we might come into it later but the the idea between an essentialism between essentialism and existentialism is so this is a, a platonic idea this is more of a postmodern idea you'll find this in Camus and Sartre uh, whether we are born with an essence something innate inside us or whether our existence comes first and therefore we have to create our meaning we have to decide what we're going to do and that's why this idea of suicide is brought in the end again that's an idea explored by Camus and Sartre uh, in which you can look for well, is that freedom is that the only way to exist without society because every other thing that you do proves that you are a member of society but if you look at uh, suicide rates <clears throat> in different countries they have different levels south korea has a really high suicide rate why is that maybe that becomes a social fact and it's determined by the understanding of the word chasal or it's determined by the difference between a guilt and a shame culture this is quite a controversial idea but some cultures are said to be based on guilt other cultures said to be based on shame uh, Ruth Benedict the anthropologist I believe uh, American anthropologist she was writing she was asked to write about the Japanese when the Americans were at war with the Japanese in the Pacific um, they needed to understand them why were these things happening why were the Japanese using kamikaze pilots and such forth because they weren't able to understand those people through their own lens so they needed to try to understand the differences in the Japanese and Ruth Benedict wrote a book called the chrysanthemum and the sword again it's controversial because she wasn't in Japan when she wrote it or, or interacting with Japanese but she came up with the idea of a guilt and a shame culture that in the West guilt if you have if you are guilty um of a crime for example even if nobody saw you do it you should still feel guilty the guilt is individual so if you do something bad but you get away with it that guilt is still meant to weigh on your conscience moreover the guilt can be absolved by serving your punishment so if you're guilty you're given 10 years and once you've done 10 years or whatever it might be stand in the corner write an essay once your punishment is done your guilt is absolved in the shame culture however um, the shame is societal based so if you do something bad and nobody sees it well then you got away with it you're not shamed Sh even if you did even if you didn't do something wrong but society thinks you did something wrong you could still be shamed for that and the shame will not go away and that might also increase the proclivity or tendencies of suicide it's also interesting that sometimes you'll notice in uh, certain societies that the shame is placed on the victim rather than the person the oppressor or uh, the criminal so the shame is placed on the victim and that's why you see in incidents such as maybe uh, Sali or Guhara things like this the person the people that have been victims they're not guilty but they were shamed in their own mind or by society they felt they were shamed so 
these two bring into this idea of society. Just remember what we're trying to get from this is that different people go different ways with who we are in relation to society. And I've introduced this idea that Alan, from Alan Watts and others that the language and words which you speak are not your own. They were given to you by others. They're, they're the thoughts and ideas of dead people that reverberate around your brain. Okay, so that's the influence of society upon the individual there. Let's continue. <clears throat> It is commonly said by anthropologists that primitive man is less individual and more completely molded by his society than civilized man. This contains an element of truth. Simpler societies are more uniform in the sense that they call for and provide opportunities for a far smaller diversity of individual skills and occupations than the more complex and advanced societies. Increasing individualization in this sense is a necessary product of modern advanced society runs through all its activities from top to bottom. But it would be a serious error to set up an antithesis between this process of individualization and the growing strength and cohesion of society. The development of society and the development of the individual go in hand in hand and condition each other. Indeed, what we mean by a complex or advanced society is a society in which the interdependence of individuals on one another has assumed advanced and complex forms. It would be dangerous to assume that the power of a modern national community to mould the character and thought of its individual members and to produce a certain degree of conformity and uniformity among them is any less than that of a primitive tribal community. The old conception of national character based on biological differences has long been exploded, but differences of national character arising out of different national backgrounds of society and education are difficult to deny. That elusive entity, human nature, has varied so much from country to country and from century to century that it is difficult not to regard it as a historical phenomenon shaped by prevailing social conditions and conventions. There are many differences between, say, Americans, Russians and Indians, but some and perhaps the most important of these differences take the form of different attitudes to social relations between individuals or, in other words, to the way in which society should be constituted, so that the study of differences between American, Russian and Indian society as a whole may well turn out to be the best way of studying differences between individual Americans, Russians and Indians. Civilized man, like primitive man, is molded by society just as effectively as society is molded by him. You can no more have the egg without the hen than you can have the hen without the egg. So quite simply um, the quote that you might be looking for which might be useful in your in your research or your work for this whole course here is a good one the development of society and the development of the individual go hand in hand and condition each other so rather than one causing the other you might be looking at an effect like this a circular effect that goes round and round. So it's not singular causal. There's not one direction of cause, but rather society affects the individual, the individual is changed, and then the individual acts, and then the individual affects society. So it's a dual causal approach there. So that's an interesting quote. If you're having trouble getting direct quotes, that might be one that you pay attention to. Of course, Biological differences, we don't really uh, focus on that too much more in society. There, there used to be a thing that different people have <clears throat> different head sizes, different brain sizes, different uh, mouth sizes, and this causes differences. And what we're saying is there's not so much differences in that. However, different cultures do produce different people. And what we're looking for is different societies and relations between individuals bring up different ideas to the way in which society should be cons constituted. So what is the ideal society? So this is where we're sort of slowly coming towards political science. What is the ideal society? This was the basis of the work of uh, Confucius, Plato, the Republic, and many more. And there's a big list here. Different cultures 
produce different answers to this question. So you notice that Confucius and Plato, they had slightly different answers. Was Were those different answers based on the fact that they were different people? Or were the different answers back based on the fact that they were in different cultures? And this is important at different times, because one culture does not stay the same for 2000 years. It changes in the values go up and di uh, go up and down. So what is the ideal society? Well, different cultures will produce different answers to that. So even though we say we're all humans and we all have human rights, of course, that is also a construction that comes from Eleanor Roosevelt in Paris writing something down. It has more of a history than that, but the modern human rights come from Paris and the wife of an American president. However, although we still are all human, we all share, uh, for the most part, two eyes, a nose, a mouth, the, the, the heart, the lungs. Our societies produce different answers to this question. What is the ideal society? And if you take, this is a really bad Korean peninsula, but if you take the Korean peninsula, you can see that the ideal society here and the ideal society here are very different. Now, why is that? It's not based on biological differences for, because for the most part, you know, you have this uh, Han Ninjo, which is an idea that comes from Shin Che Ho and then it was used by a lot by Pak Chung Yi in this heroin Ma Lundong and building the societies. But the difference, the point I'm trying to make is that there are two ideal societies, two answers to this question. And it's not based on biological differences. It's based on cultural differences. And as we were saying before, how language is very important. Up here, you have Inmin. And down here, you have maybe Gukmin, Shimin. There is a difference between these two. They're people. So this means citizens for any international students. Right? Uh, these are both citizens, essentially. But the language is political. And whether you think of yourself as an Inmin or a Gukmin, whether you think of this southern part as Dehan Minguk or Nam Chosan as Republic of Korea or South Chosan, because the North calls it South Chosan, Nam Chosan, then it changes the way you think and it changes the way who you are. So the people in these societies, their thoughts, their actions are affected by what is perceived as the ideal society. So if... Kim Dae-jung or Kim Il-sung, they have these ideas about what an ideal society should be. The question is, is that a result of the individual Kim Il-sung, the individual Kim Dae-jung? And of course, Dae-jung also means masses, which is interesting. Uh, similar to that, the individual. Is it the result of an individual or is it the product of a society that they come up with these thoughts about you know, a socialist, Kim Il-sungism, uh, or Min Jujui down here, democracy. Is it an individual or a social effect? That's what you're looking for. Uh, ESK, EHK is saying, you know, here, it go hand in hand with each other. It's not the individual. Let's continue. It would have been unnecessary to dwell on these very obvious truths, but for the fact that they have been obscured for us by the remarkable and exceptional period of history from which the Western world is only just emerging. The cult of individualism is one of the most pervasive of modern historical myths. According to the familiar account in Burkhardt's Civilization of the Renaissance in Italy, the second part of which is subtitled The Development of the Individual, the cult of the individual began with the Renaissance, when man, who had hitherto been conscious of himself only as a member of a race, people, party, family or cooperation, at length became a spiritual individual and recognised himself as such. Later, the cult was connected with the rise of capitalism and of Protestantism, with the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution and with the doctrines of laissez-faire. The rights of man and the citizen proclaimed by the French Revolution were the rights of the individual. Individualism was the basis of the great 19th century philosophy of utilitarianism. Morley's essay on compromise, a characteristic document of Victorian liberalism called Individualism and Utilitarian Utilitarianism, 
the religion of human happiness and well-being. Rugged individualism was the keynote of human progress. This may be a perfectly sound and valid analysis of the ideology of a particular historical epoch. But what I want to make clear is that the increased individualization which accompanied the rise of the modern world was a normal process of advancing civilization. A social revolution brought new social groups to positions of power. It operated, as always, through individuals and by offering fresh opportunities of individual development. And since in the early stages of capitalism, the units of production and distribution were largely in the hands of single individuals, the ideology of the new social order strongly emphasized the role of individual initiative in the social order. But the whole process was a social process, representing a specific stage in historical development and cannot be explained in terms of a revolt of individuals against society or of an emancipation of individuals from social restraints. <clears throat> You're introduced here to the, cop uh, the concept of individualism. When and why? When did people start taking on the idea that they were individuals? When did people start saying, no, I'm not just a brick in the wall. I'm not just a cog in the machine. I'm not just a father, a mother, a brother, a sister, but I'm an individual human being. When did this come about? You can see that uh, Burkhart says that it became part of the Renaissance, yeah, the Renaissance. And you'll see that that is where people all of a sudden came into it. You might even find it in uh, Descartes' skepticism of cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. It's not part of a social thing. It's very individual. And this has a historical development as well. Uh, you see it in Protestantism with... Uh, Martin Luther and the nailing of the theses to the church doors in that society or the Catholic Church won't dictate the rules from the top, but that the people have the ability and the potential to understand the religion to come closer to God by themselves. It doesn't need to be interpreted by society. God's uh, so, you know, this is not a religious lecture, but you need to understand it like this. Previously, it would be that God to the state, to the individual, individual, getting used to writing. Previously, before Martin Luther, what you would have is that God's word, God's word, right, would come through and be directed through the state to the individual. So there was a middle ground. The state had to interpret. It was written in Latin. It was written in a, a language that was unavailable to the the majority, the masses, the devil, and the dejum. However, what happened with Martin Luther and the rise of Protestantism is that this middle ground, this middle man was removed. So you still have this relationship between God and the individual. It's still, and the, relate, the Renaissance kind of maybe pushed away God, or when you get to Nietzsche, when God is dead, that's a very important idea. Maybe it doesn't mean what you think it means. Uh, but when God is dead and God goes away, then you're only left with the individual. So this development of the individual and society has changed over time. That's what it's bringing here. When do people start recognizing that? So I, I mentioned it earlier, but is Sabasa a rise of Korean individualism? Is that a reference to it using that like Shinjo or neologism? Is that what we see in it? Or is it something else? <clears throat> Many signs suggest that, even in the Western world, which was the focus of this development and of this ideology, this period of history has reached its end. I need not insist here on the rise of what is called mass democracy or on the gradual replacement of predominantly individual by predominantly collective forms of economic production and organization. But the ideology generated by this long and fruitful period is still a dominant force in Western Europe and throughout the English speaking countries. When we speak in abstract terms of the tension between liberty and equality or between individual liberty and social justice, 
we are apt to forget that fights do not occur between abstract ideas. These are not struggles between individuals as such and society as such, but between groups of individuals in society, each group striving to promote social policies favourable to it and to frustrate social policies inimical to it. Individualism in the sense no longer of a great social movement, but of false opposition between individual and society has become today the slogan of an interested group and, because of its controversial character, a barrier to our understanding of what goes on in the world. I have nothing to say against the cult of the individual as a protest against the perversion which treats the individual as a means and society or the state as the end, but we shall arrive at no real understanding, either of the past or of the present, if we attempt to operate with the concept of an abstract individual standing outside society. Some very good ideas in there. We're never going to have time to do all the ideas or for me to explain all that I want. So if I do miss things that you think are important, go and get them and find them. Carr refutes this idea of So just to be clear, Carr refutes this. This idea of a person, um, of an abstract individual standing outside society and observing what's going on and therefore being objective and truthful, he's saying that we get no real understanding if we attempt to operate with this concept. It's not really an applicable concept, this kind of, you know, this hair torum. If you look above from a bird's eye view, he's going against that. Um, where is it? It's not a battle of ideas, what I'm looking here. Here we are. We are apt to forget that fights do not occur between abstract ideas. Okay, so when, if you take that, what's an abstract idea? Democracy versus fascism right fights do not occur this is according to Carr. this is according to Carr at his time he's suggesting here fights do not occur between abstract ideas they're not struggles between individuals and society what they are is groups of individuals in society each trying to promote what is good for them and harm what is bad for them so it's not a fight between democracy and fascism. It's not an individual saying, yeah, to another one. Rather, they're groups of individuals. And they're groups of individuals. And these people are trying to promote their cause and bring it success while damaging the other people's cause. So... The ideas are not the important thing here, according to Carr. Of course, ideas such as justice and order are very important, but you need to understand that these ideas don't sort of exist in the real world. They're being pushed by groups, and they're being pushed by groups, according to Carr, to promote social policies favorable to it. So the d democratic people are always going to promote policies that are favorable to its group. They're very unlikely to say, well, we'll promote a policy that sort of damages our group. So it's all in that sense. It might be self-interest, might be realist. But the idea of it's not about ideas. It's about political groups and political interests, not even individuals here. It's very interesting to consider. Let's do uh, this one here. And this brings me at last to the point of my long digression. The common sense view of history treats it as something written by individuals about individuals. This view was certainly taken and encouraged by 19th century liberal historians and is not in substance incorrect, but it now seems oversimplified and inadequate and we need to probe deeper. The knowledge of the historian is not his exclusive individual possession. Men, probably of many generations and of many different countries, have participated in accumulating it. The men and women whose actions the historian studies were not isolated individuals acting in a vacuum. They acted in the context and under the impulse of a past society. In my last lecture, I described history as a process of interaction 
a dialogue between the historian in the present and the facts of the past. I now want to inquire into the relative weight of the individual and social elements on both sides of the equation. How far are historians single individuals and how far products of their society in their period? How far are the facts of history facts about single individuals and how far social facts? The historian then is an individual human being. Like other individuals, he is also a social phenomenon both the product and the conscious or unconscious spokesman of the society to which he belongs. It is in this capacity that he approaches the facts of the historical past. We sometimes speak of the course of history as a moving procession. The metaphor is fair enough, provided it does not tempt the historian to think of himself as an eagle surveying the scene from a lonely crag, or as a VIP at the saluting base. Nothing of the kind. The historian is just another dim figure trudging along in another part of the procession. And as the procession winds along, swerving now to the right and now to the left, and sometimes doubling back on itself, the relative positions of different parts of the procession are constantly changing, so that it may make perfectly good sense to say, for example, that we are nearer today to the Middle Ages than were our great-grandfathers a century ago, or that the age of Caesar is nearer to us than the age of Dante. New vistas, new angles of vision constantly appear as the procession and the historian with it moves along. The historian is part of history. The point in the procession at which he finds himself determines his angle of vision over the past. History is not what you think, according to Carr. So we've already said that this view of the individual looking over society or the individual watching the train of society move along that doesn't really look like a train in a linear fashion is incorrect according to eh car what he believes is that rather than this looking above and watching history pass rather than this the historian is actually in the train he's part of the society he cannot be outside of it the individual is part of society it's not above and therefore the individual is caught up in everything that's going on the individual is a product of the environment so if you personally individually have views about the environment democracy fascism feminism abortion uh, smoking self-distancing isolation they're probably not just your individual views. They're telling, they tell us something about who you are in the society that you live. And if we put you in a different society, you might have different views. So whereas in uh, the United States, issues of race and identity have become very important, that might be because the issue of race is very embedded into American history, especially with the slavery movement. However, in South Korea or Korea, where it was a more homogenous nation, and of course there was racism, uh, there was slavery, I should say. There was slavery up until, around, I guess, about 1894 when you had the Donghak uh, uprising and then the Gabo reforms, which changed to the new calendar and got rid of the, the Sangtu, the top knot. The slavery was against Koreans against Koreans. It wasn't you know, another group. So different things become important in different societies. What is important to you is a result of your culture, your history and your language. And you are moving along in this history. So you're, you're caught up in it. That's the idea that we're doing with suicide that you can't escape. You're caught up in this history moving along. So that's the first idea, if you understand that. Any questions? I can't hear you, but write your questions. But it develops, it develops to another idea because this has history as linear. And now if you're in 2020 and here was 2000, you know, the Nambuk Gwangwe uh, and the inter-Korean relations, the first summit between Kim Dae-jung, Kim, Kim Jong-il. And then you go back to 1980 and you have Gwangju and you go to 1960, etc. But this car is not saying this 
this is not history for Carr. This is wrong because he says that we might be closer to Caesar than to Dante. We might be closer to the past than our great grandfathers. Now, how does that work? Because that doesn't make mathematical or logical sense if you think of time or history as linear. Remember when I showed you that tribal thing of things going up and down? Same thing here. What um, Carr is saying is that history proceeds on a track like this. And it would even be more complicated than this, but I'm worried that I, I'll draw it wrong. So. so because we go round and round, and if you put this as 1960 and this is 1980 and this is 2000 you might notice that the distance between 1960 and 2000 is closer than the distance between 2000 and 1980 and of course it wouldn't just repeat this pattern it would go all around but do you understand here that sometimes it's not that things repeat themselves but sometimes we move through things and in 1980 we still can't see 1960 clearly so we're not influenced as much by 1960. However, 20 years later, we can see it more clearly. And then we're more influenced. So the past, the chicken and the egg, right? The duck and the geran, the past influences the present here, but not here. And therefore, the present will also influence the past. Because now we're looking at it, now we're rewriting it, now we're saying, hang on, these were the good guys or these were the bad guys? We... we bring new interpretations of it so it's this dual causal thing between the past and the present and i can't remember if i mentioned it last time but if you haven't watched dark on netflix go and watch it because it's fantastic for that kind of stuff i've only seen season one so please no spoilers uh, it's a german drama but can you understand what kari is saying here and so these thoughts and ideas that you have are influenced by the present and the society, but they're also influenced by the past and different moments of the past. That's why you see sort of, um, if you look at these events in South Korea, you know, they sort of go up and then down and they return again and they come back. There, there are waves and swells of which movements seem to generate. They don't go in a, a fashion like this. That would be incorrect. So this is Carr's view of history. The first point is that the individual is caught up in it. The individual cannot escape history. And history doesn't proceed in a linear form. It goes up and down. Now, if I take you back to this question, I really wish I could just rub this out, but I don't know how. Uh, I'm still working out my system. I can, can clear the whole thing, but not this. What is the perfect society this is essentially political science right there's that question what is the perfect society what is the ideal society so we have this question now when people answer this question when people emerge and they arise and they say we need to do this and we need to do this and and this their answers are generated because of this and because of this because they're caught up in society and society is going around this historical track, which is always changing what is important. It's always changing what it sees about the past. So this idea of what is the perfect society, you're understanding, is there any objectivity? Or do we always need to look at the individual in a group? in time so you think that we need this in society okay your idea is well we need to give money to the poor we need to have more women as, as politicians we need to uh, help the refugees we need to stop dealing with china whatever it might be your opinions great but they're your opinions based on you in a group in time they're not just timeless in a vacuum that you have assessed. And they've been produced in language. We should add this as well, right? Produced by 
a language or a culture that is not made by you. You know, you're repeating other ideas and things. When you say equality, that's not your idea. So what is the perfect society? When we read these ideas from Nietzsche, from Bentham, from Plato, whoever they might be, we need to consider these things. I hope that kind of makes sense and uh, prompts you into some ideas. Let's... Uh, I'm going to I'm going to skip some because otherwise we'll never get through it. This is talking about the idea that people change over time and the books that they write will be a reflection of what they said. So we we've, we've got this. This is another similar idea. If you read about this and you like it and you want to focus on it in your essay, please do, but I'm just trying to do it for time. <clears throat> Do, 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 do. Mm. Let's start here because there's an important part from Marx and beyond. Some political philosophers complain of a tired lull and the absence at present of argument on general politics in this country. Practical solutions are sought for concrete problems while programs and ideals are forgotten by both parties. But to me, this attitude seems to betoken a greater national maturity. And I can only wish that it may long continue undisturbed by the workings of political philosophy. I do not want at the moment to join issue with this view. I will reserve that for a later lecture. My purpose here is merely to understand or appreciate the work of the historian unless you have first grasped the standpoint from which he himself approached it. Secondly, that that standpoint is itself rooted in a social and historical background. Do not forget that, as Marx once said. The educator himself has to be educated. In modern jargon, the brain of the brainwasher it has itself been washed. The historian, before he begins to write history, is the product of history. So that is a conclusion or a summation of everything that I've just tried to explain to you. Maybe if you just read that paragraph, you won't quite get it all, so I've tried to get it. Um, ideals. Is politics now... Practical policies versus ideals. Can you understand the difference between these? So ideals will be justice and democracy and free speech and order. Practical practical policies are more, you no, know, we need to give 2% of our money to that particular uh, part of society so they get better in the houses over there. What he's saying is that some people are complaining um, there's no kind of argument over ideals anymore. You'll find this in uh, Daniel Bell and the end of ideology. Very difficult to read, actually, for young students. But the end of ideology, a bit like uh, Francis Fukuyama's end of history. The end of ideology, that the ideals, we don't really debate ideals anymore. You know, we've, we've got to the stage where, yeah, we all kind of think justice is important and democracy is important. We agree on the ideals, but we don't agree on the practical policies and how to mm, enact them. So we agree on ideals, but practical policies in such as should we tax the rich 40 percent or should we tax the rich 10 percent? Should we give the health care for free or should we give the health care for 10 percent or should we make everybody pay for their own health care? These are sort of more practical. We all agree that we need health care and we need hospitals, but how it's played out practically is different. So have we reached the end of ideals or do ideals still matter in politics? That's one question you want to consider when you take the Yodang and the Yadang, the ruling and the opposition party in South Korea or your own country. Are they battling about practical policies or are they battling about ideals? Do, 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 do. We're going to miss the uh, the Whig interpretation of history. 
we come into iconoclism and iconoclastic work and let's go here if we move for a moment from the individual historian to what may be called broad trends in historical writing the extent to which the historian is the product of his society becomes all the more apparent in the 19th century british historians with scarcely an exception regard the course of history as a demonstration of the principle of progress they express the ideology of a society in a condition of remarkably rapid progress history was full of meaning for british historians so long as it seemed to be going our way now that it has taken a wrong turning belief in the meaning of history has become a heresy after the first world war toynbee made a desperate attempt to replace a linear view of history by a cyclical theory the characteristic ideology of a society in decline since toynbee's failure british historians have for the most part been content to throw in their hands and declare that there is no general pattern in history at all a banal remark by fisher to that effect has achieved almost as wide a popularity as rank's aphorism in the last century if anyone tells me that the british historians of the last 30 years experienced this change of heart as the result of profound individual reflection and of the burning of midnight oil in their separate garrets I shall not think it necessary to contest the fact, but I shall continue to regard all this individual thinking and oil burning as a social phenomenon, the product and expression of a fundamental change in the character and outlook of our society since 1914. There is no more significant pointer to the character of a society than the kind of history it writes or fails to write. Gale, the Dutch historian, in his fascinating monograph translated into English under the title Napoleon For and Against, shows how the successive judgments of French 19th century histor historians on Napoleon reflected the changing and conflicting patterns of French political life and that thought throughout the century. The thought of historians, as of other human beings, is moulded by the environment of the time and place. Acton, who fully recognised this truth, sought an escape from history itself. History, he wrote, must be our deliverer, not only from the undue influence of other times, but from the undue influence of our own, from the tyranny of environment and the pressure of air we breathe. So uh, I was trying to point out this idea. A linear view of history by a cyclical theory. So whether history is going in a linear progression, it's going sort of like this, or whether history goes like this you can see this in the christian or judeo-christian idea that we start from zero and therefore we're going one two three four we're building up we're going somewhere the reason why it's 2020 is because jesus was supposedly born on that day so the world isn't 2020 years old, but we've demarcated or the West has demarcated this moment in time as being the start of an era or a paradigm. And from that we are building towards. And if you look at the Judeo Christian or Islamic uh, traditions, these are the monotheic monotheistic traditions. Let's put it monotheism these are monotheist traditions where that mono being there's one god above in the sky right they all share this they all believe in the end of time they all have an end of days revelation something's going to come and the world will end so there is a progress over time we're building from naught to something other views of history and more in the east when you get into things like pantheism or monism you also find this a bit in spinoza but you find it in buddhism and hinduism and taoism that time's going round and round that's why you have the uh if you look at the clock like that time does go round and round and it repeats and you go from the year of the the year of the rat to the year of the cow to the year of the dragon the year of the tiger and once you're finished you go back and you do them again and time is a, a repeating cyclical thing so there are different views on what time is here the characteristic ideology of a society in decline okay so 
This idea of cyclical is the characteristic ideology of a society in decline. Marcus Aurelius. I hope I've spelt that right. Marcus Aurelius said um, when he was in charge in Rome, it said, all that is happening to me now has happened in the past and will happen again in the future. So there's this kind of giving up. It's like, well, it's, it's meant to happen. There's not much we can do about it. It's, it's happened before. It will happen again. Here we are stuck in the middle with you. Um, and that is like society here. We might see that as society is giving up. It's in decline. It's on its way down. It's sort of giving up the progress, giving up the idea that things can be better. So how do you feel about this idea that cyclical theory of time and progress is a sign that a society is in decline? That's what we get there. In my first lecture, I said, before you study the history, study the historian. Now I would add, before you study the historian, study his historical and social environment. The historian, being an individual, is also a product of history and of society. And it is in this twofold light that the student of history must learn to regard him. Now let us leave the historian and consider the other side of my equation, the facts of history, in the light of the same problem. Is the object of the historian's inquiry the behaviour of individuals or the action of social forces? Here I'm moving on to well-trodden ground. When Sir Isaiah Berlin published a few years ago a sparkling and popular essay entitled Historical Inevitability, to the main thesis of which I shall return later in these lectures, he headed it with a motto culled from the works of Mr. T.S. Eliot, Vast Impersonal Forces. And throughout the essay, he pokes fun at people who believe in vast impersonal forces rather than individuals as the decisive factor in history. What I will call the bad King John theory of history, the view that what matters in history is the character and behavior of individuals, has a long pedigree. The desire to postulate individual genius as the creative force in history is characteristic of the primitive stages of historical consciousness. The ancient Greeks liked to label the achievements of the past with the names of eponymous heroes supposedly responsible for them, to attribute their epics to a bard called Homer, and their laws and institutions to a Lycurgus or a Solon. The same inclination reappears at the Renaissance, when Plutarch, a biographer, moralist, was much more popular and influential a figure in the classical revival than the historians of antiquity. In this country, in particular, we all learned this theory, so to speak, at our mother's knee, and today we should probably recognise that there is something childish, or at any rate, childlike, about it. It had some plausibility in days when societies were simpler, and public affairs have appeared to be run by a handful of known individuals. It clearly does not fit the more complex society of our times, and the birth in the 19th century of the new science of sociology was a response to this growing complexity. Yet the old tradition dies hard. At the beginning of this century, history is the biography of great men was still a re reputable dictum. Only ten years ago, a distinguished American historian accused his colleagues, perhaps not too seriously, of the mass murder of historical characters by treating them as puppets of social and economic forces. Addicts of this theory tend nowadays to be shy about it, but after some searching, I found an excellent contemporary statement of it in the introduction of, to one of Miss Wedgwood's books. The behaviour of men as individuals, she writes, is more interesting to me than their behaviour as groups or classes. History can be written with this bias as well as another. It is neither more nor less misleading. This book is an attempt to understand how these men felt and why, in their own estimation, they acted as they did. This statement is precise, and since Miss Wedgwood is a popular writer, many people, I am sure, think as she does. Dr. Rouse tells us, for instance, that the Elizabethan system broke down because James I was incapable of understanding it, and that the English Revolution of the 17th century was an accidental event, due to the stupidity of the first Stuart kings. More and more examples. Let's get to the main point. Miss Wedgwood's statement, then, combines two propositions. The first is that the behaviour of men as individuals is distinct from their behaviour as members of groups or classes, and that the historian, 
may legitimately choose to dwell on the one rather than on the other. The second is that the study of the behavior of men as individuals consists of the study of their conscious motives of their actions. So we've got this idea here, this um, theory of the great man of history. We'll, we'll continue in a little bit, but before we do, you get two contrasting ideas. So I'm always trying to present two contrasting ideas to you and how you feel or understand them is important. You have vast impersonal forces, okay, which is from uh, Eliot and Isaiah Berlin. And what Karin here is calling the bad King John theory. Now, when things happen in history, so let's take Korea's democratization. Take the French Revolution. Did these things happen because of these vast impersonal forces? Or did these things happen because individuals are the decisive factor in history? What is the pushing thing? What is the thing that makes these events come to fruition? Are there these things that exist outside of our control and there's there's history with a... That's not a very good capital letter. H, but history with a capital H, history that moves by itself, history that has its own motivations, determinations and ideas, or is it purely in the idea of the individual that things move forward? Different events are related to different people. Was World War I the result of people making bad decisions, or was World War I the result of various systemic forces in the international system that just were beyond people's control and there was a balance of power and they clashed together. Was Korea's democratization, say, a necessity? It was inevitable. It was going to happen because Koreans are built for democracy and there was no stopping it. There was this vast tide coming. Or was it stopped by certain people and then encouraged by certain people how does that work that's what he's talking about here so when we have political ideas in society do certain political ideas naturally come to the top or do they work that way as impersonal forces or are they pushed by individuals <clears throat> and their motivations i should have added sorry so there he puts Miss Wedgwood's propositions. After what I've already said, I need not labour the first point. It is not that the view of man as an individual is more or less misleading than the view of him as a member of the group. It is the attempt to draw a distinction between the two which is misleading. The individual is by definition a member of society, or probably of more than one society. Call it group, class, tribe, nation, or what you will. Early biologists were content to classify species of birds, beasts and fishes in cages, aquariums and showcases, and did not seek to study the living creature in relation to its environment. Perhaps the social sciences today have not yet fully emerged from that primitive stage. Some people distinguish between psychology as the science of the individual and sociology as the science of society, and the name psychologism has been given to the view that all social problems are ultimately reducible to the analysis of individual human behavior. But the psychologist who failed to study the social environment of the individual would not get very far. It is tempting to make a distinction between biography, which treats man as an individual, and history, which treats man as part of a whole, and to suggest that good biography makes bad history. Nothing causes more error and unfairness in man's view of history, Acton once wrote, than the interest which is inspired by individual characters. But this distinction, too, is unreal. Nor do I want to take shelter behind the Victorian proverb placed by G. M. Young on the title book of his page of his book, Victorian England. Servants talk about people, gentlefolk discuss things. Some biographies are serious contributions to history. In my own field, Isaac Dusch's biographies of Stalin and Trotsky are astounding examples. Others belong to literature, like the historical novel. To Lytton Strachey, writes Professor Trevor Roper, historical problems were always and only 
problems of individual behaviour and individual eccentricity. Historical problems, the problems of politics and society, he never sought to answer or even to ask. Nobody is obliged to write or read history, and excellent books can be written about the past which are not history. But I think we are entitled by convention, as I propose to do in these lectures, to reserve the word history for the process of inquiry into the past of man in society. The second point, i.e. that history is concerned to inquire why individuals in their own estimation acted as they did, seems at first sight extremely odd, and I suspect that Miss Wedgwood, like other sensible people, does not practice what she preaches. If she does, she must write some very queer history. Everyone knows today that human beings do not always, or perhaps even habitually, act from motives of which they are fully conscious or which they are willing to avow, and to exclude insight into unconscious or unavowed motives is surely a way of going about one's work with one eye willfully shut. This, however, what according to some people historians ought to do. The point is this, so long as you are content to say that the badness of King John consisted in his greed or stupidity, or ambition to play the tyrant, you are speaking in terms of individual qualities which are comprehensible even at the level of nursery history. But once you begin to say that King John was the unconscious tool of vested interests opposed to the rise of power of the feudal barons, you not only introduce a more complicated and sophisticated view of King John's badness, but you appear to suggest that historical events are determined not by conscious actions of individuals, but by some extraneous and all-powerful forces guarding their unconscious will. This is, of course, nonsense. So far as I am concerned, I have no belief in divine providence, world spirit, manifest destiny, history with a capital H, or any other of the abstractions which have sometimes been supposed to guide the course of events, and I should endorse without qualification the comment of Marx. History does nothing. It possesses no immense wealth, fights no battles. It is rather man, real living man, who does everything, who possesses and fights. The two remarks which I have to make on this question have nothing to do with any abstract view of history and are based on purely empirical observation. What Carr is introducing here is that it's not simply... individual motivations and it's not simply impersonal forces he doesn't believe in these he doesn't believe in history with a capital h he doesn't believe in spirit destiny you see a lot of that in political groups it is our destiny it's our duty it's it's our mission it's our goal you see a lot of talk of impersonal for impersonal forces you might want to understand why when they come you see a lot of them actually in totalitarian societies such as nazi germany such as uh, north korea where they have an unnerving mission they have a goal and they're working towards that goal and it will be carried out because history deems it that it must happen. If you read the literature, you'll see a lot in that. Uh, you'll also sometimes see it in, uh, what, what shall we call this, universalism or cosmopolitanism, where it's we need human rights for all and it is our destiny or it's our mission to have uh, everybody on the planet enjoying such liberties. Okay? They're, they're not too dissimilar in that they have this manifest destiny this world spirit that applies to all people beyond their culture history with a capital h so what car is doing here he's saying you cannot avoid unconscious or unavowed motives what he's saying here is that people in politics people when we act we are driven by unconscious motivations we're driven by things inside us that are not physical that maybe we don't even know about and this is one of the revelations of psychology but there are sometimes you have work to do and you know you have to do it but you sit down and you play games on your smartphone or you play guitar you go drinking 
And then once you finish, you go, why did I do that? I have to do this work. That was silly of me. You do things that you're not in control of. You do things sometimes that you don't even want to do and you know you shouldn't do it, but you still do it. We have unconscious motivations that sort of rise and compete with each other. You know? So Freud put that down into the ego, the superego and the id. We have our animalistic desires, we have our rational desires and we have societal desires, which would be the superego tells us what to do. We have these things, if you've seen the movie Inside Out, where you have a sort of anger is personified and, and jealousy and happiness, all these things competing for each other inside us. And if you look at humans' behavior, if you look at how we interact in society, that seems to play out. We don't behave in the way that we always should. We're not completely rational beings and we often do things that we do not understand and we do not want to do. There seems to be lots of empirical evidence for that. So if we take that into account, then when people do things, when people act politically, when people put forward agendas, when people try to explain what's happening, when you look at the last week's text with the coddling of the American mind, when the authors are explaining what's happening, they're driven by unconscious motivations, whether they're good or bad. The people in the stories, the professors and the students that are competing, they're both driven by unconscious motivations. It's not just they have one goal or it's something pushing them towards uh, a destiny, but there are unconscious motivations produced. And these unconscious motivations, more importantly, if you understood it in the first part of the lecture, were that these unconscious motivations are not always yours. These unconscious motivations, because they form themselves in language and in culture, they're the product of the society in which you're produced. So you'll have ideas and, and things in you that might be the motivations, that might be the desires of other people. And that's a really weird thing to get at. But you need to not just look at explicit or conscious motivations, according to Carr. You need not just to look at this version of history or, or politics that's going along but you need to look at people in context and work out what their unconscious motivations are because even those people don't know what they are so then how can we know then we get to a dead end but they are there because we exist as societies uh, as individuals sorry in society that's that's moving along We need to investigate this idea of politics. Is it is politics about the individuals or is politics about the society? Where do we start looking for this? Right? That's that ties into that group and individuals, what we were doing last time. Let's have a look what Carl brings to it. <clears throat> so he's got two remarks here. The first is that history is to a considerable extent a matter of numbers. Carl Lyell was responsible for the unfortunate assertion that history is the biography of great men. But listen to him at his most eloquent and his greatest historical work. Hunger and nakedness and nightmare oppression lying heavy on 25 million hearts. This, not the wounded vanities or contradicted philosophies of philosophical advocates, rich shopkeepers, rural noblesse, was the prime mover in the French Revolution, as the like will be in all such revolutions in all countries. Hunger of 25 million. Not elite, not young man, not philosophers, not the the nobles, the, the prime thing of this that was going on was in the society. It was in 25 million. That's according to Carlyle. Or as Lenin said, politics begin where the masses are, not where there are thousands, but where there are millions. That is where serious politics begin. Carlyle's and Lenin's millions were millions of individuals. There was nothing impersonal about them. Discussions of this question sometimes confuse anonymity with impersonality. 
People do not cease to be people or individuals. Individuals because we do not know their names. Mr. Elliot's vast impersonal forces were the individuals whom Clarendon, a bolder and franker conservative, calls dirty people of no name. These nameless millions were individuals acting more or less unconsciously together and constituting a social force. The historian will not in ordinary circumstances need to take cognizance of a single discontented peasant or discontented village. But millions of discontented peasants in thousands of villages are a factor which no historian will ignore. The reasons which deter Jones from getting married do not interest the historian unless the same reasons also deter thousands of other individuals of Jones's generation and bring about a substantial fall in a marriage rate. In any event, they may well be historically significant. Nor need we be perturbed by the platitude that movements are started by minorities. All effective movements have few leaders and a multitude of followers, but this does not mean that the multitude is not essential to their success. Numbers count in history. A couple of very interesting ideas there. Movements are studied by minorities. All effective movements have few leaders and a multitude of followers. But this does not mean that the multitude is not essential. So all movements you might point to uh, in South Korea's democratization, you might point to Kim Dae-jung. Uh, in, in Russia, you might point to Trotsky and Lenin and Stalin. You might point to Mao in China. Wh whatever events you look at. And so we get stuck in looking at the individual because all these movements have one individual and thousands and millions of followers. And so it's natural for us to look at these people, but Carr's saying it's these that are sometimes essential to the success because if you just have the Kim Dae-jung, if you just have the Stalin or the Mao, without the numbers then nothing happens. The numbers matter. So, and these people, if one person follows, if one person makes a decision, Kari is saying here, it's not interesting to us. It's interesting to us when thousands or millions of people start doing something. So, if Greta Thunberg says, you know, I'm upset and I'm angry about this, well, it, it's a person. But if thousands tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people started doing the same thing, then it becomes very political, at least in that politics it begins where the masses are. So it's not about when one person does it, it's about when hundreds or thousands of people do it. And when they do it together, they don't become impersonal. They don't cease to be individuals just because we don't know their names. They're still people and they still have those... Uh, unconscious motivations that I was talking to you about. This is, uh, if you look for this, Emil, I'll spell the name right, I hope. Emil Durkheim with his Sui Generi social facts. That when people come together like this, they constitute these new social facts that don't exist amongst the individuals. So it might be the marriage rate, the suicide rate. Things like that. The sui generis social facts is, uh, think about it like this, 2 plus 2 equals 5. It's creating something out of nothing. 2 plus 2 equals 4. But when you bring all these people together, it creates something bigger. And this is how you can begin to understand it. Take a bit more, but that. My second observation is even better attested. Writers of many different schools of thought have concurred in remarking that the actions of individual human beings often have results which were not intended or desired by the actors, or indeed by any other individual. The Christian believes that the individual, acting consciously for his own often selfish ends, is the unconscious agent of God's purpose. Mandeville's private vices, public benefits was an early and deliberately paradoxical, paradoxical expression of this discovery. Adam Smith's hidden hand and Hegel's cunning of reason which sets individuals to work for it and to serve its purpose, though the individuals believe themselves to be fulfilling their own personal desires, are too familiar to require quotation. In the second production of their means of production, wrote Marx in the preface to his Critique of Political Economy, human beings enter into definite and necessary relations which are independent of their will. 
Man lives consciously for himself, wrote Tolstoy in War and Peace, echoing Adam Smith, but is an unconscious instrument in the attainment of the historic universal aims of humanity. And here, to round off this anthology, which is already long enough, is Professor Butterfield. There is something in the nature of historical events which twists the course of history in a direction that no man ever intended. Since 1914, after a hundred years of only minor local wars, we have had two major world wars. It would not be a plausible explanation of this phenomenon to maintain that more individuals wanted war, or fewer wanted peace in the first half of the 20th century than in the last three quarters of the 19th. It is difficult to believe that any individual willed or desired the great economic depression of the 1930s, yet it was indubitably brought about by the actions of individuals, each consciously pursuing some totally different aim. Nor does the diagnosis of a discrepancy between the intentions of the individual and the results of his action always have to wait for the retrospective historian. He does not mean to go to war, wrote Lodge of Wid Woodrow Wilson in March 1917, but I think he will be carried away by events. It defies all the evidence to suggest that history can be written on the basis of explanations in terms of human intentions, or of accounts of their motives given by the actors themselves, of why, in their own estimation, they acted as they did. The facts of history are indeed facts about individuals, but not about actions of individuals performed in isolation, and not about the motives, real or imaginary, from which individuals suppose themselves to have acted. They are facts about the relations of individuals to one another in society, and about the social forces which produce from the actions of individuals results often at variance with, and sometimes opposite to, the results which they themselves intended. The Cunning of Reason Private Vices, Public Benefits Let's have a look at this. Where are we? Where's the Cunning of Reason? I've lost it. <laughs> Probably someone's looking at the screen going, There it is, David. You've missed it. Thank you. Mandeville's private vices, public benefits. Uh, Timur Kuran uh, is, I think, a Harvard economist. Uh, he has this new idea called, um, let me get it, private lies, public truths. So Timur Kuran tries to explain uh, the development or the election of president donald trump brexit situations like that and it's related to the coddling of the american mind and uh call out culture which is very important what we're looking at uh, timo Coran takes mandeville's uh things which is the development of smiths privatized public truths that in i've i've written it the wrong way around <laughs> i think Public lies, private truths. Sorry. When they create these ideas, you have to make sure you get them the right way around in your head, and I need to double check this is the right way. To explain it, Timur Koran was saying that with the election of Donald Trump and Brexit, that people will lie in public about their motivations and their desires. They will lie in public about what they're going to do so when you poll them and when you do surveys everyone says yeah i want peace and harmony and i i want these things but when they go into their private lives and when they go into the private voting booth they have a different meaning and that's why all of a sudden bang trump is elected and everyone's like nobody predicted this all the polls were wrong that's because people had these desires, they had these uh, motivations, but the political culture was such that they were afraid or consciously or unconsciously unwilling to speak about them in public. And, and that's why these people win. And with the same with Brexit, you know, everyone in public, you have to say, of course, that human rights are good and open borders and love everyone and everyone's the same. But in private, people might go home and go, 
yeah, but my village shop has closed down. And they will have all these reasons in their in their minds. And so the difference between the uh, the public and the private is very important here in politics. So Timo Koran tries to explain that developing on Mandevilles. And that's why political events are happening that we do not predict because people's public statements are different from what they hold as truths in their private lives. Hegel's cunning of reason, excuse me, <coughs> Hegel's cunning of reason uh, was kind of interestingly explained one um, for economics. And I believe it was, it was it Quran's book as well, which is called Unintended Consequences. I want to explore this idea. It might be the last one we do because we're running out of time. Unintended consequences. So Carl was talking about here. Uh, and this is building on Hegel. Carl was talking about here that nobody wanted war. Nobody, you know, there were a couple of wars in this century, but there were two huge wars in, in the 20th century. It wasn't because more people wanted war. It, nobody really wanted those wars, definitely. Maybe there were one or two, but the majority of the people didn't want war. And the number of people that wanted war in the 18th century or the 19th and the 20th century didn't necessarily change. Nobody wanted the Great Depression. Nobody wanted people to lose their houses, their families, their livelihoods. That, that wasn't the intention, but it still happened. So why did it happen? It happened because the cunning of reason. It happened because unintended consequences. It happened because we might try to take uh, a Jenga block here, but what happens is over here, this one shakes. It's the butterfly effect. It's that kind of thing that a uh, butterfly flaps its wings over here and there's a revolution in Rio. These things do happen. And they happen without our desires it's not what we intend and we cannot even foresee what will be the consequences of our actions there are two examples one is from the book free economics i'll just explain this one if i remember it correctly uh the snake problem um and this was that when the british were colonizing india they there were snakes everywhere and they didn't like the snakes. The snakes were dangerous and they caused problems. And, you know, it, it wasn't very conducive to having a, uh, a stable society to have snakes crawling around everywhere, biting people. The snakes were just being snakes. It's not the snakes fault. So the British decided that we'll give you, I forget the, uh, the currency at the time or what it was being used. We'll give you, uh, let's say one pound for every snake that you give us go out and get all the snakes and we'll give you one pound uh for every snake that you bring to us and that will get rid of the problem we'll pay them to to bring however what the the people realized the indian people realized was that to raise snakes only cost about 50 pence or even less so that they could raise snakes they could you know grow you don't grow snakes but they could raise snakes and then go and take them for more money so the the result of the policy here, the result of the policy to offer people one pound to bring in their snakes and to get rid of the snakes, the result was that there were more snakes. Now, that wasn't what the people intended. That wasn't what the people wanted. It was the exact opposite. However, that was the result. There's this cunning of reason. There's these unintended consequences that come along. Uh, the second example I'll give of this very quickly, and my name, the name has uh, gone from my head. I try to keep too many things in my head. There is a famous feminist professor from Evergreen College uh, who wrote books in the 1960s and 70s, really supported uh, and promoted the feminist movement in America. And I interviewed her. I forget her name. I'll find it later. Um, maybe someone's shouting at me. I interviewed her about the new domestic laws in South Korea. I, I think it was uh, Shim Sang Jong was doing this no superwoman law. So the women shouldn't be expected to work all day and then cook and clean at night. They were trying to bring in laws that would 
make women's lives better in society and so I asked her about these things and uh, what her thoughts were and she said to me I said will this make society better and she said we don't know because we'll try to solve this problem here and another thing's going to come up here the idea that you can ever completely solve society is impossible she was saying to me you do this but it's going to cause a knock-on effect there will be something else that you didn't predict and expect will come out elsewhere in society and then you're going to have to focus on that so she said it's not whether um this law is good or bad or how uh, whether we try to do this or this she said that it's more about the process of discussion between the two parties right so it's not about going towards a final set society that you have in your mind it's not about the destination but it's about the process and it's about making sure that the process is free from discrimination the process is free from violence and the process is cordial and maintained uh, Stephanie Kuntz I believe her name was it always comes to you late um, Stephanie Kuntz was the professor that had this idea that if you think about it another way I'll give you one more example of this what she was saying Fabio Capello and Arrigo Sacchi Italian football managers they had this idea of football like a bed right? so if you imagine a bed and you're in bed but imagine your blanket is only this big you can't cover your body and your legs right so you'll let your feet are cold in bed but if you pull the blanket down to your legs then uh let me try and draw this ha huh, terrible drawer if you pull the blanket down to your legs then the top of your body is cold so there's always going to be one part the blanket is not enough to cover and he was talking about that you could have a good defense you could have a good attack you can't get both you're always going to be uh, sacrificing something and, and that's the idea in society as well here Carr is talking about unintended consequences we can't plan what's going to happen it might be a great beautiful political movement but what will be the results of that you don't know even if the motivations are good you don't know and you don't even know what your motivations are because they're unconscious and your motivations are also not only yours but they're the product of the society and the environment in which you live these are some of the last ideas that I want to leave you with it's an hour and 30 so I think this is enough time um, there is more obviously uh, for this but if any of your ideas come through here that's great but stopping on this path you, it's going to be hard to get all of this into one thought there's probably lots of things running about in your mind please try to get some of the ideas from the text or the lecture not all of them necessarily one or two please try to quote them directly if I put this here then people might realize that I'm talking about a different thing start the video at this point when you do your assignment please try to get a couple of ideas from the text or the video when you do try to get direct quotes you can put subtitles on the YouTube video or you can get it from the book because sometimes when you think you've got the idea but you don't directly quote it you're misremembering it or you're misinterpreting it so go and get the actual quote go and get what I said go and get what Carr said and then put it down and explore it build a context around it don't just put quote opinion quote opinion that's not what I'm saying but when you read E.H. Carr, he had quotes inside his work, didn't he? That's what you need to be doing, direct quotes. You do that so that you don't misinterpret or misremember. The assignments that you're doing, not necessarily going towards your final grades, but I want to be looking at you, who's doing good work, who needs help, and things like that. This is kind of a hard material, but see if you can demonstrate that you've understood something, that you're analysing something, and that you're not just accepting but you're understanding and then thinking about things that's what you need to be doing uh, I'll stop here for now if you have any questions or comments get in touch with me I hope you enjoyed this lecture I, I highly recommend reading EH Carr as, as much as well you can because it's a uh, fantastic stuff 
Thank you very much. I'm David Tizard and I will see you next week.